All right, I see participants beginning to join. Um, we're gonna just give it a few minutes and let folks begin to log on. Just bear with us. I have to shout out to Jane. Jane Lanick, you're on the call. How nice to see you. Okay, it looks like we've leveled off a little bit. Um, I assume we will still have some people joining us. Um, so uh, my name is Karen Murphy. I am clinical associate professor here at Boston University's Wheelock College. And I am also the early childhood program director. And I am very, very thrilled to be here with my fellow panelists. Um, I will be moderating this afternoon, this evening. Um, and I am just going to share my screen. All right. So we're here this evening um, to have a discussion, hopefully a lively discussion um, about outdoor nature-based education for young children. And I am so happy to be joined by my colleagues. And um, I'm gonna introduce them very briefly uh, and they will say more about their background and about their work when it's their time to speak. So I'm thrilled to introduce Sarah Bessie and Shayla Sinelian, who are two of our BU Wheelock Early Childhood alums and are also co-founders of the Boston Outdoor Preschool Network with a colleague of theirs, Sarah Murray. Um, and they were additionally our 2021 BU Wheelock Young Alumni Awardees. So we're so happy that they're able to join us this evening and share the work that they're doing. We're also joined by Jeff Winokur, who is a science education consultant and a longtime colleague of mine at Wheelock, um, who has been um, working for a long time, additionally, with the Science edu um, Educational Development Center and more recently with the City Sprouts program. Um, and I'd also like to introduce Anna Maria Caballero, who is a nature educator at the uh, Arnold Arboretum um, and has been working with me around some of our science curriculum at BU Wheelock in our early childhood program. And I'd like to welcome them and thank them very much for the time that they spent preparing for this presentation and, and discussion. Um, we'd like to get a sense of who's here, so we're going to do a quick poll just so we can see who's in the audience. Oh, that's, that's poll two. Can we do poll one? All right, we'll do this one. Um, it, are you all seeing, are you getting outside as well? Okay, so go ahead and respond. And I think that the second poll will give us information about who's here. They're just a slightly different. All right. Oh, good. That's pretty good. So I want to give you a little bit of information. Oh, so we've got the results. I want to give you a little bit of information about what the format is going to be this evening. So we have four questions that we use to organize um, our speaking. Uh, and the four questions are, 
uh, what are the benefits of outdoor nature-based educational experience um, and specifically focusing on young children, but many of them apply to, to other age groups as well. Um, how does outdoor nature-based education support and extend learning that happens in other types of settings? What are important strategies and considerations for outdoor na nature educators or for others who wanna engage children in this way? Um, and then how can families and educators expose young children to more outdoor nature-based experiences? Um, so the way it's gonna work is each speaker is gonna take the lead on one of the questions and they've prepared remarks um, and examples and other things to share with you. And then after each speaker finishes their prepared remarks, we'll go to the panel and see if any other panelists have additional comments, expansions, ideas that they would like to add to the previous speaker's um, presentation. You should feel free throughout to add any questions you have for the panelists in the Q&A. Um, if you have a question for a specific panelist, please indicate that in your question. Uh, we will, if, if it's a more general question, obviously feel free to add that as well. We will save questions until the end, and at which time we'll get to as many questions as we can, um, unless a question has already been addressed by a previous speaker. Um, you should also feel free in the chat to share any experiences, resources you would like to share with the group, um, or if you would like to just interact with one another. All right, so I would like to introduce Anna Maria Caballero, who's going to address our first question, question, which is what are the benefits of outdoor nature based education? Anna Maria. Thank you, uh, Karen, and I'm going to stay on speaker view for a bit. Um, just to say something about myself. My name is Anna Maria Caballero and I am the outdoor educator at the Arnold Arboretum. My role within the Children's Education Department is to support Boston Public School children who come to the Arboretum for field studies um, and also for self-guided trips. I also train our volunteers and I offer professional development for educators. Um, and it was really exciting to see that in the poll, about 54% of you said that you come out, you know, you take your children out almost every day. So, it will probably not be too much of a surprise to you if I list a few health benefits, right, of, of being outside. There's been a lot of research affirming that many benefits of nature to adults and children. Health benefits include lower blood pressure, reduced stress, a boost to the immune system, increased anti-cancer proteins. Cognitive gains include improved focus and higher standardized test scores. Other benefits include fewer sleep difficulties, faster healing after illness, increased emotional resilience, and stronger mental health. Recently, doctors have pegged computer vision syndrome as a direct consequence of too much screen time. And there has been a documented increase in myopia, nearsightedness in young children. Surprise, being outdoors can alleviate these symptoms as children look out into the distance and relax the eyes. So unlike a snake oil salesperson, I can say that being outdoors is the perfect remedy to all that ails us. But today I wanna to speak a little bit more personally and anecdotally to what I have seen and noticed as unique benefits of outdoor learning for the children of the Boston Public Schools who attend our field study programs these are two hour landscape explorations of specific life science concepts that happens in small groups with our trained volunteers. So I wanna bring up my top five benefits. All right. Action. the physical nature of human space and uses children to experience words upon which later learning is built. It offers our knowledge that follow the duration and some effects are arranged upon the part of stone. Anna Maria? Shadow. 
I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we can't hear your audio. It's cutting in and out. Uh oh, bear with us. We're having technical difficulties. Anna Maria, are you there? I'm, I'm back now. I think I was off for a bit. All right, I froze. We're all there. Can you hear Just me? Just for a moment. We can hear you, yeah. I wonder if you take your camera off, if that will help the sound. Um, I was on a Bluetooth, but I turned it off. So, oh, okay. Now. Okay. I think that may, okay. Now, how much did you miss? <laughs> I, it, it started cutting out right away. So why don't you start from the top? Okay. All right. Oh my goodness. So benefit number one, all right, let me just start right with the benefits that I've noticed here at the, at, uh, the Arboretum. Um, learning outdoors teaches children a sense of scale and perspective. It reinforces a cyclical nature of time and space and introduces children to experiences and words upon which later learning is built. This is how background knowledge is created. Children become the star when they experience the concept watch the seasons change, follow the germination and growth of a seedling, discover the effects of a rainstorm on the earth, break apart stones, climb the shadow of a tree limb, or come face to face with a snapping turtle for the first time. These experiences introduce vocabulary and demand that children narrate what they see, hear, and feel. They use words in context, invent words creatively, make connections between first and English language learning. This is learning that integrates all domains, physical, cognitive, emotional, and social. And this is learning that puts the child in the driver's seat, not learning that is done to the child. Benefit number two, context. Being in nature brings the book and the classroom learning alive by putting all that information in context. If we begin with the premise that science is learning about the world around us, then the world around us is the natural world. Vocabulary and concepts make more sense when children can touch, feel, see, hear, and explore these same words and concepts in real life, in context. It is here that we see that a frog does indeed eat a fish, or that a hawk does not always catch the snake, or that frog calls lead to mating. And here's another true story for context. An elementary age child confessed to one of our guides that she was afraid of squirrels. She was afraid of its front teeth, its rat looking face and its size. When the guide asked the child, how big do you think a squirrel is? The child indicated with her hand an animal about two and a half feet tall. This child had probably never seen a squirrel in context, only perhaps in books or movies. I have seen firsthand how being in nature, context, has helped children overcome perceived misconceptions and fears. Once the child catches their first worm or a centipede in a bug box, all worry, fear, and disgust at that task goes away. They can't get enough of digging through the soil and leaf litter looking for critters. Benefit number three is messiness. The outdoors is messy. Unexpected things happen to frustrate, delight, and surprise every day. Rain begins to fall. You come across a dead squirrel. Okay. Salamander you so very much wanted to see didn't make an appearance. Someone let their dog poop bag on the path. A tree has to be cut down because of a storm. 
a coyote follows a dog on a leash. When children encounter unexpected events, they learn to manage disappointment, perhaps fear and worry, in proportion with the encounter. They learn to be flexible and come, with alter come up with alternatives. Tolerating discomfort that comes from unpredictable and messy nature leads children to develop a sense of personal competence. Part of growing up is learning how to release these negative emotions in the face of inevitable stress. If kids never figure out how to do that, they're more likely to experience severe anxiety as teenagers. These experiences outside are often the most memorable of unexpected wonders. Benefit number four, global citizens. Children who are outdoors learn from a very young age that their actions and interactions with the natural world affect the natural world. It is one thing to be indoors and learn about trash or talk about how cutting trees is bad for the environment. It is quite another to see the effects of human activity on our world. Young children who learn to love the outdoors are more likely to become adults who work to preserve it for future generations. Benefit number five, magic. So often after a session, young children tell us that they don't wanna leave. They wanna live here forever. They see the Arboretum as a magical place. They're filled with a sense of possibilities. Very quickly, many children feel a sense of belonging that comes from peace, calm, and happiness that they experience in the outdoors. Pure joy. They want to share this place with their families. They want to come back. As educators, parents, caregivers, we need to be intentional in letting children be children for as long as possible. If we do it right, this magic stays with them throughout life. Beautiful, Anna Maria. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that you started with the health benefits, um, which really elevates that this is something that's good for all of us in so many, many ways and in such needed ways currently. Um, I'd like to invite our other panelists if they have either things that they'd like to expand on or additional things that they would like to ask Anna Maria to expand on. Or comments they would like to add. I'll just comment. I, I love your last slide with the magic yeah. and, and just that sense of possibility. I like the way you articulated. It's just a sense of anything's possible when you're out there in nature and it's calm and it's not busy, 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 like, like the, the classroom is indoors. It's much calmer and more peaceful. And you can just, you have the room and the space to, to think. Um, and I love how you articulated that. Thank you. You know, and back to what you were saying, Karen, um, I think that as adults, we understand the health benefits for us, mm -hmm. but we don't necessarily imagine or think that children need it as much as we do, if not more than we do. You know, we're out there exercising and doing everything we can and being really good about being in nature. And we forget that children are also reaping the same benefits mm -hmm. for their little bodies. Yep, great point. And I, I love the the, uh, the unexpected, you know, the dead squirrel and the, the poop bag, um, because that's real life. I mean, those things are real. and. Uh, I, I, it's very much appreciated. A lot of times the classroom is orchestrated to avoid such things and the outdoors, not, this, not the same. Right, that actually is a pretty good segue. Um, so for our second question, um, Jeff has prepared some remarks about what are some of the ways that outdoor nature-based learning expands on learning that takes place in other types of contexts, in classrooms and in other types of educational settings, in museums. Um, so he is gonna share with us some of his insights about and examples of the ways in which this, um, this kind of learning actually supports, expands on, and um, complements other types of learning. Jeff? 
Well, thanks, Karen. And thanks to my fellow panelists, Sarah, Shayla, and Anna Maria. And Anna Maria, you've set me up pretty well um, because I'm uh, wanting to talk about the classroom in particular. Um, uh, in my work, I the short form of what I've been doing for quite a while is doing my best to help adults teach more and better science in the classroom. So I'm going to focus on science education um, as an outgrowth of outdoor education. Um, and the other, so he, I am really the least of the outdoor educators among this group here. Everybody else is a true outdoor educator. I use the outdoors as one venue for uh, science. And um, I'd like to start with, uh, before I share some slides, with a recent experience I had in a classroom, a kindergarten classroom. And I'm glad to say I was finally back in observing classrooms, which, you know, for those of you out in schools, you know, it's been quite a slog. Um, it was a kindergarten classroom and they were reading the book, Busy Spring. And um, the, the book talks about how the winter has been gray and cold and now the garden is awakening in the spring. And uh, the teacher did not read the entire book. She just read parts of it because she wanted to connect it with an outdoor experience because this school has a garden as many of the uh, uh, schools that I've been working with recently and through City Sprouts, they all have school gardens. So they have an outdoor venue for their science learning. And so instead of reading the whole book and you know, had she done that, we'd have said that's a fine literacy experience. Um, but she also just stopped short and said, now we're going to go out into our garden. And uh, what do you think we're gonna see out there? So she began a conversation with her students about what they thought would be out there, sort of uh, predictive, sometimes guessing, but the kids were very excited about this. And then, you know, one would say something like a worm or a budding flower. And she would say, so where do you think we'll see that? And when someone said, well, the worm will be in the ground, why do you think the worm is in the ground? So she was sort of, uh, no pun intended, seeding um, the conversation for later uh, based on some really important science concepts. Um, and we could say that was a literacy experience. We could say it was a science experience. Who cares, really? It's, good. it's a good experience. But from the perspective of the classroom teacher who needs to cover the traditional topics, there's both science and literacy going on. So now I will share my screen. Um, and... Uh, just one point I would make, and you can't see, I, I don't know if you can see the garlic clove there that was just there for decoration. But uh, one of the things that I like to do a lot is take the, uh, the outdoors in um, by doing whatever we can in the classroom to connect with the outdoors so that it enriches the outdoor experience and the outdoor experience can enrich the indoor experience. Um, so if we just talk about that experience of the uh, classroom reading and then going outside to the garden, there's, uh, there are skills aplenty here, such as observation and all kinds of evidence-based reasoning. There are many science concepts, and I've just named a couple here, the idea of the characteristics of the needs of living things, habitat, why would a worm be in that part of the garden and not another? Um, there was plenty of literacy going on. Uh, the comprehension of the, the indoor reading along with speaking and listening skills throughout. And uh, in a moment, I'm gonna share some writing with you from uh, cl several classrooms. And we I didn't mention math just yet. I'll talk about that a little less today, but th there's always opportunity for measurement in a meaningful, there's the context word that Anna Maria raised, but it's a real context. We're not just measuring you know, the, our desk or something like that. We're measuring something real in the, in the real world and always using math language. So um, a, a word about the next two slides. This, this is a preschool. This is from a preschool, uh, a classroom where uh, the kids had been outside and they found some snails and the kids and the teacher decided to bring some snails in for a, for a while just to be temporary visitors, but to uh, see what they could learn indoors by observing them and they had already observed them outdoors. 
So um, they did reading about the snails. They, of course, observed the snails, looked at them, made all kinds of guesses about what they like to eat. Um, and they did some writing. And this is a four-year-old's writing, as you can tell. Um, and it says that's the part the egg comes out, they kiss and they dig because they want to put the eggs inside, then they put the dirt inside. So they had been reading about snail reproduction and uh, that snails lay eggs in the soil. And clearly um, the teacher has scribed this child's writing. But that's one example of four-year-old writing. Here's another one. They'd also discovered through their investigations and their research that the body of a snail is called a foot, which is a really interesting challenge for many of us because it doesn't appear like a foot the way we know feet. Um, and this child wrote what she thought was a problem. This problem is that the snail walks with one foot um, because after all, most of us walk with two feet and yet the snail can do this with one foot. So it raised vocabulary issues, uh, certainly writing and uh, the, um, the phonetic awareness here is pretty amazing, I think. Walk, W-O-A-K, that sounds about right to me. Um, so again, is this science or literacy? And my answer always is yes. It's both. And this is grade one for those of you who work with older kids. Uh, this looks like graduate school to those of you who are working with preschoolers. But this is after students had been examining and forcing bulbs indoors because they were sure um, at, at the beginning of the year that all plants needed soil. And uh, for those of you who do not read first grade with fluency, uh, I'll read it. It has humongous leaves. And again, look at the phonics here, that awareness. I used to think that plants needed compost and soil, but I seen the truth. They do not need compost and soil, but they do need sun and water. Uh, to me, this is one of the most sophisticated um, bits of writing I've ever seen, and it's a first grader. Um, there is math um, involved too, and this is just one example of forcing a garlic bulb indoors and looking at the various parts um, using both non-standard and standard measurement. Uh, here's a more standard looking way of uh, measuring growth over time in a plant. And all of which is to say that um, the outdoors and the indoors are very good venues for science learning. Uh, this is just one graphic that colleagues and I uh, have used to try to help us think about where are there opportunities for learning about science concepts. And um, they are indoors, they are outdoors, they're in our homes. And, um, and if we begin to think about not just the outdoors, but the outdoors as a venue for certain kinds of learning, we can match it with uh, what we're doing indoors and make it a much more enriching experience for our students. So I'll turn it back to uh, Karen. Well, I've got to unshare, don't I? <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. I'm just uh, always so excited to think about the depth of learning and, and the learning that happens sort of as a matter of course, you know, that you don't have to try so hard when you're enjoying what you're doing, you know, that you're learning sort of effortlessly just by being exposed to these concepts and these processes. Um, I know uh, both Jeff and Anna Maria have really helped me to develop my own teaching. I teach a science methods class um, at BU Wheelock. And one of the things that's really important to me is that my students have an opportunity to experience that kind of learning, right? To, to, to have hands-on science experiences, not just you know, me telling them, how do you teach children? So that they know what that feels like to learn that way. Um, and Anna Maria has been coming and providing some outdoor learning experiences as well as kind of bringing the outdoors in for my classes for the last couple of years. And it's just so important for students, future teachers to have those experiences, I believe, so that it can inform how they approach, you know, science and outdoor education with the children that they work with. So I really, really appreciate those examples, Jeff. And I'd like to invite if other panelists either have comments or, or other thoughts that they would like to add about outdoor learning. Yeah, if I can, you know, comment on what you were saying, Jeff, that I think makes so much sense is that the examples you gave 
are everyday examples that happen around us. And you know, in the lingo, we call that natural phenomenon, right? The whole science standards are talking about using science to explain natural phenomenon. And when you're outside, you can't but be faced with all of these things. So you find a bunch of eggs this morning. I was with a bunch of uh, kindergartners and we found a bunch of eggs underneath a log. And you know, what do we do? How do we explain it? Where did it come from? What does it need? Which eggs are there? There's all these possibilities of trying to make sense of that particular piece of phenomenon. And that's exactly what really good learning in science is. We ready to move on? All right. So I would like to, Shayla, are you ready? I would like to introduce Shayla Sanelian, who is going to address our third question, which is what are strategies and approaches that outdoor nature educators um, need to keep in mind, especially as they're working with our younger children. Um, and Shayla has prepared some comments and examples for you around that question. Shayla. Jeff, thank you. We can go to the next slide. Okay, as you can see, my three words, passion for teaching, love for the outdoors, and perseverance. Passion for teaching. In order for a teacher to have the passion for teaching children, you have to understand that it takes patience and understanding. As educators, we have the passion and understanding, we must shift our mindset to become outdoor educators. It takes a driven force of passion. Love for outdoors, you have to love the outdoors and you have to dig deeper to determine what your strengths and weaknesses are, as well as what, sh what your um, children's needs and interests are. Persevere, it comes with the weather. <laughs> Being an outdoor educator, <laughs> when, when the weather is so challenging, you need to persevere. You need to keep going and get children out in nature. Even in a, you know, four degrees, 13 degrees weather, rainy, snowy, sunshine, we're out there. Um, so our perseverance leads us into not giving up our beliefs and also protecting children's outdoor time and teaching them endurance. So it takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of passion. Um, you know, you could be, you know, a traditional teacher, but the moment you get involved into the outdoor, there are, there could be many barriers, but if you do have the passion for it, um, you can, do what you want out there. Next slide, please. So some considerations um, is understanding your physical ability. Um, we can start with hiking. So knowing, you know, how long it might take to go on a hike with, you know, with a child, knowing how long it might take for the child to go on a hike. So your own ability plays a big role. It could be one, 0.5 miles, you don't, you as a teacher got tired, but the children, they, they want to keep going. So you have to understand your own ability. Are you gonna just give up and say, nope, let's just stop? Or are you gonna keep going um, to help the child understand? Although it seems far, but we got one more minute to go. Um, so understanding that when children comes to school with gloves on, understanding that, hey, I'm very cold, but I have to take my gloves off to put theirs on as well. And that was a quote by a Boffin teacher. Um, being able to be outdoors in all kinds of weathers, um, as an outdoor educator, you know, we are outdoor, whether it's hot, whether it's rainy, and whether it's cold. And you have to be able to dress well and support your body um, in order to be um, out there. 
So understanding your physical abilities. Um, so the next one is emotional, mental abilities. So multitasking, as teachers, we multitask a lot. Um, so knowing how to cope with inclement weather in order to think quickly and clearly despite being uncomfortable and make decisions about how to comfort a child who is cold while making sure that the rest of the class um, is also safe. Sometimes you could have seven children who are, you know, saying my hands are cold, my feet are cold, um, while you have another six playing. So how, you, how do you as a teacher comfort, you know, all these seven children? You could say, hey, let's all, let's all dance around. Let's all run, let's do, let's race each other just so you are keeping them safe, you are keeping their bodies um, moving. Um, and also you have um, to be able to think about the interests of the children and also introduce them to lessons in nature um, that involves math and literacy. Personal growth. Ed educating um, children about nature requires, you know, teaching skills and also the outdoor knowledge. Um, you could be a teacher, but when it comes to the outdoor, you really don't, you might not know all the names to a plant. Um, you might not, you know, know whether this is a rabbit poop or this is a squirrel poop, but you can ask the children, oh, you know, what do you think this is? They might have hypothesis, but together, although you don't know the answer, you can go and you can search it, you can get books. And together you can also figure out um, the answer to that question. So it means that most people will have strength in either of those areas, whether you have the skill to teach, um, whether you have the knowledge um, you know, for outdoor. You must be able um, to open to learning and growing on a personal level to bring the best to the children. So we all make mistakes, we all make we all um, make errors, but together with the children, we can learn. Uh, so parent communication, oh, yeah, yeah, parent communication is a big, big, big. Um, it's a big thing. So. Regular educators could just, hey, you know, your child had a great day, you know, you know, he did this, he did that. But being an outdoor educator, you have to make sure you say, hey, your child's clothes was wet today. Um, your child's boots got soaked. I think I have a website for you to go to. Maybe you could check this um, different brand. You have to consistently communicate with the parents because the children are in your care. Um, you have to make sure when they come from outside, it's a very heavy um, rainy day that they do have the proper gear um, to wear. So communication comes a, a very, very um, long way. Um, so at Boffin, we do have learning gears and we do have extra clothes that um, we have in hand for the children to use. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, strategies to connect children with nature. There are three types of learning related to nature. So there's learning in nature, which is taking a traditional classroom lesson outside. Um, there's learning about nature. Today, it's an example. Today we will learn about the parts of, of the corn, their form and their function. And then we have learning with nature, an unplanned for learning based on what nature presents and what children show in interest. Um, you can go to the next slide um, for me, Jeff. So we have over here some of um, the children in our program. So these are, you know, lessons that you could uh, just sit in a traditional classroom that you do, but we do them outside. Um, some children are working on their letters. Some children are working on math and we have a child who was just counting all the pine cones that um, she found. You can go to the next slide for me. So learning about nature. Again, a quote, today we will learn about the parts of a corn or the life cycle of plants. So we have, these are our little toddlers. Um, 
it was actually on a four degree weather day. Um, they found some corns outside. Um, they came, they brought it inside and, you know, they were investigating. We have some of the, um, some of the children who are um, learning about parts of a plant. They're, they're learning the life cycle of a plant and, and also they're reading books about it. Jeff, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Learning with nature. So these are all the wonderful, amazing things that you can find in nature. Sometimes you can find an owl pellet. Sometimes it's a worm. Sometimes it's, it's hey, here's a river. Hey, here's a puddle of water. Let's jump. Let's run. Um, here's sticks. Let's build a fort. So these are just unplanned things that you find in nature that you would not find in a traditional classroom. Jeff, you can go to the next slide. can take me now. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Shayla. I love the examples. Um, and I think that learning with nature is the one that I imagine that people who are not familiar with outdoor nature-based education are least familiar with, is just going outside and seeing what the experience brings to you and being open to that. Um, I know a lot of educators I work with don't really like the uncertainty of that. You know, they wanna be able to predict, you know, they wanna be able to say, this is what we're learning about today and this is how we're gonna do that. And so I think for some educators that, you know, is, is that personal growth is getting more comfortable with that and, and sort of the unexpected and the, the emergent or spontaneous learning experiences that children are able to have when they're, when they're outdoors experiencing, you know, unexpected encounters or phenomenon. So I really appreciate Shayla, you including that and the personal growth aspect of it, because as a, as a teacher educator, I think that that's something that many teachers struggle with a little bit. Other comments or thoughts about Shayla's? Well, I, I'm struck by uh, the need for, for gear, <laughs> the need for preparing to go outside in the coldest and most foul weather. And uh, just, um, I, I'm just assuming that the, the parents, the families are, know what they're getting into. Um, so it's sort of a self-selected crowd, but it would be great to see more of that because there's so often, you know, when I'm dealing with classrooms where people don't want to go out because it's cold and by cold, Cold, they don't mean the cold you're talking about. They mean, you know, a little, little uncomfortable. So I, I'm really struck by how important it is that parent communication piece that you spoke about, Shayla. Mm -hmm. And I know that Sarah's going to talk some more about gear later. Go ahead, Shayla. Sorry. No, it is. It takes a, you know, a lot of communication, especially around, you know, the gears. Um, but Sarah will get into more details. Before you go on, I think um, I do want to go back to Shayla. You saw, this whole idea of learning with nature is so cool because I'm thinking of a book that I recommended at the end of the presentation by Rachel Carson. You know, it's a, it's a 1965 published book, A Sense of Wonder. Mm -hmm. And children can be in nature and they can be learning with nature, but they do need this caring adult that is going to help interface their experiences with them. And I think that um, you and Bopin and any outdoor educator that we have, that's the strength of the program are the caring adults that are helping to um, set up the experience, explain it or, or open up more ideas around that experience. So it's like having, you know, being a real nature guide uh, for the children is really, really important. So learning with nature, but with a very strong guide. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Anna Maria. I think I've seen you do that incredibly during Arboretum field trips um, or the other guides at the Arboretum. Um, but one thing I would say is if, if you're feeling uncomfortable learning with nature, go to the place where you're planning to go before you bring the children there and spend some time getting to know the landscape, seeing what the, it's called affordances, seeing what the opportunities are that the landscape is presenting, whether it's 
you know, spring flowers or lots of leaves or whatever is there, get to know it and feel comfortable with it and think about possibilities for how learning might go before you even bring the children there the first time it can help you feel a little more comfortable. And can I add more, Sarah? And it's, it's, it's like Karen had said, it's the unknown. We're often as educators, we are afraid of the unknown, but we don't have to. Like a child could ask us a question we can research that question with them and, and make them feel like they're helping us, um, they're teaching us to answer that question. Um, so it's always good to show that, hey, I don't know, but let's find out together. All right, and I am gonna turn it over to Sarah, who is going to expand on some of the things that Shayla brought up. Um, and in particular, you know, provide some some guidance, some strategies that educators and also families who want to include more outdoor nature-based education in the, the children that they care for in their lives. So some specific suggestions she has for how one might begin to do more of that. Sarah? Yeah, perfect. Um, thanks, you can go on to the next slide. Great, so I'm just gonna talk first about how to dress children for the outdoor learning and all, all different types of weather conditions. And then after that, I'll talk about how to chill keep children safe. And you're welcome to follow up with me afterwards if you have any additional questions. So, yep, just keep going. Next slide. Um, so if you notice that the, on the left, I'm, uh, I pulled out a waterproof book and this was not actually circle time. This is all the children coming over because they were shocked by the concept of a waterproof book and had never, <laughs> were very interested in learning more about that. <laughs> So there they all are. As you can see, they all have hoods on because it's a pretty cold, rainy day. Um, on the right, you're gonna notice this boy, Nico. He has a hat and then an insulated layer and then a raincoat on top of that. So his raincoat has to be big enough to fit over his winter jacket. So when you're buying rain gear, try to buy the rain suit the next size up so it fits over your child's insulated jacket and insulated pants. Okay, next, next slide. Uh, so on the left, you're gonna see two boys um, in rain suits. One of them I think is Oki Wear, and I think the one on the right is Muddy Buddy. So Oki Wear and Muddy Buddy are two of the brands that uh, produce low cost full body rain suits. Full body has pros and cons, we can get into that later. Oh, and on the right is our other co-founder, Sarah Murray, and the girl next to her is um, very prepared for the rain. <laughs> you can keep going. Next slide. Snowy days is just, people tend to be a little more familiar with how to dress for snowy days. It's just, you know, snow pants. Um, I would recommend uh, mittens instead of gloves because mittens have the fingers together. So they keep the child's hands a little bit warmer. Um, some of these kids are probably wearing a pair of small mittens underneath their insulated mittens. That's a great strategy. Hand and toe warmers are also great. You can buy reusable. Uh, that you just boil to reactivate, or you can buy disposable. Disposable are better, but reusable are cheaper. Um, uh, you know, snowy days actually are easier than cold rain. I would say cold rain is the most difficult weather condition. So like 30 degrees and raining is really, really tough. Um, so for those days, you want what Nico was wearing. You want, you know, a base layer, mid layer of fleece or down, winter jacket, and then rain clothes on top of all of that. And then on rainy days, you're gonna to have to swap out the mittens very frequently. So when the mittens get wet, unless you have rain mittens, rain mittens are amazing, but if you don't have rain mittens then you can just have to keep swapping out the mittens. So our program actually, um, for all weather conditions, we buy uh, small mittens in bulk. Um, it's a little bit tricky because you, you can't do fine motor if you have a big mitten on and the kids see something little and they want to they want to touch it they want to pick it up they want to experience it so they rip the mitten off oh no right <laughs> so there's a balance between between encouraging that exploration of small things while also keeping the mittens on so there's different strategies for toddler versus preschool very different okay uh next slide <laughs> Here's some links. You can explore these later. Uh, the video uh, of, the, of the adult dressing for Arctic conditions is particularly interesting. Um, keep, we can keep going here. Next slide. Uh, when you're talking to kids about challenging weather, we never say, oh, this is a bad weather day. It's not bad. It's just challenging. It's a lot. 
<laughs> um, and when, as a teacher, you really have to be thinking, is the child that I have in front of me, are they uncomfortable or are they unsafe? There's a really big difference. And I think in our culture, there's become a little bit of confusion around that. But we have to clarify, is, is the child uncomfortable or are they unsafe? If they're unsafe, then we need to take immediate action. If they're uncomfortable, then we can have lots of strategies. Like our, I would say our number one strategy is running around. Um, like for example, if a child sits down and eats snack for five minutes and they look like they're getting a little cold, try to pack away the snack and get them moving. They can always have a little more snack later. Um, but one thing at the beginning of our program when we first started was that some, some snacks would be really large and then the kids would be sitting for too long on cold days. So you really just want to have a small snack. Uh, we call it a pocket snack. So maybe a bar or some carrot sticks that fit inside the pocket. You can just whip them out, eat it with your mitten on. You don't even have to take your mitten off for like a carrot stick, for example, and then just keep moving. Um, yeah, yeah, we can keep going here. Ah, so risks versus hazards. Now we're gonna talk about safety. So we just covered clothing, now we're on to safety. Um, so a risk is something that the children can recognize and choose to take on. For example, they see a big log, they decide to climb up on it and they try to balance on it. That's a risk. A hazard is something that the kid doesn't know about, that they're unaware of. So for example, a cliff would be a hazard if the kid didn't know it was there. Um, so uh, you know, as when we're thinking about outdoor education, we have to, we, we do have risky play. Kids do climb onto logs. They balance on logs. We're not always on stable, even ground. We're on slippery surfaces. Um, that's a risk. Um, but a hazard is something you that the, the teacher's job is to protect children from hazards while providing an environment where children can take risks. Next slide. Ah, this is a very long one. So I'll just cover a few things. Um, you really, really, really want to prevent lost children. Luckily, we've never had a lost child, but that's really important because you don't have walls outdoors. So you really have to count them very frequently and you know who your runners are. So you have your runners, but you also have your sneakers. There are some kids who will kind of hide or they'll, they'll try to quietly drift away. You have to have, you know, everybody knows who those kids are. Um, and you need to really keep an eye on them just to make sure that you need to come back with the exact same number of kids that you went out with. That is so important. So thinking about pickup in particular, you want to think about your pickup routine. If you're doing pickup outdoors or drop off or any other transition, you want to have one person as a lifeguard. So the job of the lifeguard, and you could even make a necklace or a badge or something that says lifeguard. <laughs> The job of the lifeguard is to make sure that everybody is safe. So the lifeguard isn't narrowly focused on one child. They're looking at the whole class as a whole to make sure that everybody is safe. So one person always, at least one person always has to be on that lifeguard duty. Um, the other thing to keep, keep in mind is just be really careful near vehicles and near water. Those are two, those are two things. Um, so we can keep going. Uh, yeah, so we use orange cones to provide boundaries. You can also use natural boundaries. This is just what happens to work for us. Next slide. Uh, so, okay, so this teacher knows these kids and they've been in her class for a long time and she's good with classroom management. So she's allowing them to pick up snow and throw it into the brook. But if this were the first month of school, you wouldn't see that happening. <laughs> So she also has other teachers who aren't in the photo. Um, so she also has two other teachers with her as well. Um, so just, you know, the relationships and classroom management are there before you take on these riskier activities. Um, next slide. Oh, and this is just a boy who finally was able to climb up onto the big log and walk across it. It was a fun day. All right, next slide. <laughs> Um, so we welcome you to come visit us. We, we are, host many visitors, mostly educators from other programs or parents who are interested. Um, so feel free to email us if you'd just like additional information or just to come and visit and see our program outdoors in action. All right, and then the next two slides are just some resources. These are very selected, just some of um, obviously, obviously the organizations that our panelists are associated with, but also just a couple of um, nice resources for folks that are, are interested in maybe getting um, a little bit more research um, or, or outdoor information. Um, the next slide 
is um, includes the print resources, including the sense of wonder that was mentioned earlier. Um, and then you can see at the very end of this slide is my contact information. If you'd like to follow up on this presentation, if you find you have a lingering question or want more information, feel free to reach out to me. Or if you would just like more information about BU Wheelock's early childhood programs, I'm happy to field questions about that. So we can take these slides down. Um, and we have a short time. I know we lost a few minutes uh, earlier, but we do have a short time for questions. We had a question come in earlier. I think we have begun to address it, um, but I'd like to read it. Uh, this is from Emma. Those unexpected things, and I think this is referring, Anna Maria, to, to what you mentioned, dead squirrels, wild animals, make me nervous as a young teacher, but I see the benefit. How do we keep children safe and still allow them to explore their environment? And I know, Sarah, you just gave some very specific strategies that you use in Bopin, but I wonder if you or other panelists have additional thoughts um, on that question. Uh, one of the questions that I guess I would have for, for Emma is, what is, so when you said it makes me uncomfortable, so thinking a lot about what is that comfort? So for example, you come across a dead squirrel, what are you uncomfortable about? Is it that you have to explain death to a child? Is it that you don't wanna to touch it or you think the child might touch it and will get a disease that comes from, from a dead animal? Um, what is it about that encounter that makes you uncomfortable? Because if you can figure that out, then you can find safe ways to address it. So if it is about death, um, I think normalizing it in terms of, well, you know, this is, this is really sad. You know, the squirrel is not live anymore. What do you think happened to it? And did it become food for another animal? And if it did, then that other animal is alive because of this. So sort of putting the experience in the context of nature in general and how that works. Um, if it is around, um, uh, what Sarah was talking about, a hazard. You know, if there's something outside that's messy, but it's really hazardous and it's a safety issue, then there are other strategies that you would take. You know, you could take five steps back with the children. You can distract them and go somewhere else. So um, I think thinking back to what it is that makes you uncomfortable and trying to figure that out will help you figure out what's the best way to move forward from there. Thanks, I think that's very, very um, thoughtful response, Anna Maria. And I, I would just add that to go out yourself first and really get used to this uh, environment and see what uh, the potential hazards might be or risks. Uh, um, and I, I think a, a lot of adults are uncomfortable with some of the things you named, Anna Maria, and, but other things just like bugs or other little creepy crawly things or whatever. And I think educating yourself about which ones really are harmful and which ones really are not can be a big help to prepare you to do this, uh, take the kids out. We have a couple more questions. Um, I don't know that we'll have time to get to all of them. Um, a couple of them are related, so I'm going to sort of ask them together. Um, one question is, how frequently do children in the outdoor preschool network go outside? And I, I understand that to be all the time within safety parameters. So um, I think that's essentially your entire program, yes? Um, but the other question that is, is connected to this one is, is there a similar network for elementary school that you know of? Um, and then there's also um, recommendations for how classroom elementary teacher can become an outdoor educator. And I don't know, Sarah and Shayla, if you have information about sort of the network outside of early childhood or outside of. Yeah, there's for this for this teacher who asked the question, um, look into the Forest Fridays or Forest Days movement. There, there's there's a book written about this by uh, Liza Lowe, I believe. And so more and more teachers are, are taking their children to a natural space on a regular basis. So once a week, they'll, they'll have either three hours, two hours, or a full day outdoors instead of indoors. This movement started in New Hampshire and Vermont, where a lot of schools just so happen to be located next to large forests, <laughs> right? But people like us, we're trying to figure out how to bring this into um, urban areas so that um, 
you know, there's a, there's a set schedule of once a week heading outdoors, rain or shine. Uh, part of that involves a lot of logistics management. So you can feel free to reach out to us. Um, we're happy to help with that piece. Uh, the other piece is gear, just having a huge gear library and then somewhere to hang up all the rain suits when they're dry. Um, so if you can overcome some of the gear barriers and logistical barriers, a lot of schools are doing Forest Fridays and have had great experiences with that. All right, we are at time. Um, there are a couple, so there was a comment made in the Q&A that I'm just adding to the chat. Um, and the other two questions that we haven't had time to really address has to do with doing this kind of education in schools um, and sort of the logistical and um, I think administrative and uh, other types of barriers within a kind of a more formal school environment. And I don't know, Jeff, if you want to talk a little bit about what are some of the ways that City Sprouts is trying to address that within that sort of that public school parameter. And I know, Anne-Marie, you also work with public schools that do programming at, at the Arboretum. Well, I mean, it is a tough sell. Um, but I, I think that the best way to address this is to know the standards, know the curriculum, and know what you can do uh, outdoors and how it can connect. And that's what we are trying to do in City Sprouts. That is to not only get people outdoors into the garden because of all the wonderful benefits that uh, the other panelists have mentioned, but also because there's potential for real science learning. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to know what that is. And unless you do, um, it's really hard. It's a hard sell because after all the administrators and schools are responsible for the tests and you know i say it like that but it's you know these are realities that we need to address and i think we i think both are possible but we have to be knowledgeable in how to address that so what we try to do is help teachers know what the standards are and where those standards can be met out of the classroom as well as in hannah maria last words on public schools and nature-based education I think, um, you know, I, I agree, it is always a challenge and I, I do several programs for professional development where teachers totally buy into what we're selling, you know, but then they hit that wall. Mm -hmm. How do I do that in the classroom and the reality of a classroom is different right you have these schedules you have other pieces that get into play. Um, but to the extent that you can look at what you can control as a teacher, what, what part of the day do you really control? Can they read their book outside? You know, sometimes it's a matter of just that. You have to do literacy, you have to read, you do squirt once a week, you know, whatever the acronym these days is for reading it uh, out together, do it outdoors. Uh, you want to do a poetry unit, do your poetry outside. So look at the pieces of your day that you can control and which ones of those can you start doing it outdoors? That sort of would be the what I think um, Shayla said, teaching in nature first. And maybe you can slowly work your way towards teaching in and then with. Lovely, thank you all so much. We're, we're a little past time, so we're gonna have to wrap it up. Um, I really wanna thank all of you for the very thoughtful preparation and comments and, and sharing your work with all of us. Um, and I also really want to thank the participants for the thoughtful questions and, and for being here. Um, as you probably can tell, we, we all feel very strongly about the value um, of this kind of learning. And so we're, we're thrilled to see so many people here to, to learn more about it. Thank you so much.